The book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Ephesians. And I want to have a look at chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Of course, this is the mighty Apostle Paul writing to the church at Ephesus. Ephesians is a bit like the, I think it's the Pentecostal epistle. It's just got a bit of something, something, you know, a little bit of, a little bit of get up and run. And it says this in chapter 5 and verse 14. And Paul's writing, he says, Therefore he says, Awake you who sleep. Arise from the dead. I love that. A church is fully alive. I want to be fully alive. Arise from the dead and Christ will give you light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine. Now he's not saying don't be drunk. He's just clarifying what you are and what you're not allowed to be drunk with. I don't know if that's a a soft laughter because you don't think it was funny or if there's a bit of guilt in the room. (laughs) We'll we'll save that for the altar call. He says, do not be drunk with wine in which is excess or dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. I don't know if I'll finish my message. I just wanna get at least the first half done and then we're gonna have an altar call. I'm believing God's gonna move in this place tonight by His Spirit. But I wanna talk about being filled with the Spirit. Now, when we talk about being filled with the Spirit, oftentimes we, uh, we're, we're preaching on the baptism in the Holy Spirit. We're talking about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And when we talk about being filled with the Spirit, we'll do a message on being baptised in the Holy Ghost. And I believe in the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I believe every believer can be baptised in the Holy Spirit and should be baptised in the Holy Spirit. But I'm not so much teaching about the initial baptism in the Holy Spirit because in this text, that's actually not what Paul is dealing with because who is writing to is the church at Ephesus. Now this church started with a zip bang boom. This thing this thing started with the power of God. Paul, he gets to Ephesus. There's a little church there, about 12 people. And he gets to Ephesus. He found some disciples. And, and I, I don't know, this is conjecture, but I wonder if Paul thought something was missing in this group of people because he felt the need to ask a question. He said, hey, did you guys... Receive the Holy Spirit when you believe. So you got saved. Did you get the Holy Ghost? Are you baptised in the Spirit? He knew there was something missing from uh, what was happening there. And they said to him something that I find so fascinating. They said, we didn't know we could be filled with the Holy Spirit. The the Scripture says we didn't know there was a Holy Ghost. And and he says, well, how were you baptised? They said into John's baptism, but they were disciples. So they were followers of the Lord. But they'd been baptised in water, but they'd never received the baptism in the Holy Ghost. And the Bible tells us He laid His hands on them. They received the baptism in the Spirit. They, they were speaking in tongues. They, were, they, they, they went from being good disciples to Spirit-filled disciples. And, and so, so, so that's how the church started. Few, we're, we're a little later here now and, and, and Timothy's pastoring this great mighty church at Ephesus. And, and Paul writes to Timothy, and, and, and this is the word that he has for the church. He says, don't be drunk with wine wherein it's excess. He said, but be filled with the Spirit. He wasn't talking to, I, I mean, I, I'm not trying to create us versus them, but he wasn't talking to some mainline kind of denominational kind of conservative, you know, wear your robes and, 
ha- have your, your liturgies and, and be very traditional. He wasn't talking to a church like that and saying, hey, be filled with the Spirit. He was talking to a church just like this. He was talking to a church that had started in the power of God, that had started in the power of the Holy Spirit. And he knew that that same power that birthed it was the same power that would sustain it. And so he spoke to those believers, just like we're putting a weekend on like this, because your pastors and your leaders know that we might start in the power of God, but like anything, we can leak. We can, I don't know about you, put me in an airport, I can leak. Put me in traffic, I can leak. Put me in Krispy Kreme donuts. <laughs> and so Paul writes the church and he says, be filled with the Spirit. But you know what I love about this? The, the word filled here doesn't mean one time. It means to be continually being filled. I mean, some of you got filled with the Spirit on Noah's Ark. But can I say it's time for a fresh anointing. It's time for a fresh touch from heaven. I mean, I mean a, a fresh infilling. He was talking to the church in Ephesus and said, hey man, you need a new anointing. Man. You, you, we gotta get under something fresh. We need a fresh touch of the power of the Holy Spirit. And I wanna encourage us tonight to believe that God wants to refill and, and, and fire us up in the Spirit of God. And, and, and we, being filled, I mean, it's a, it's a powerful thing, but being filled, it's actually a recognisable condition. I got given a book. Uh, it was years ago, a guy called Dan, he's a principal of a school, a great friend of mine on Pentecost Sunday, he walks in my office, this is a few years ago, and he gives me a book called Pentecost. And he thought it was hilarious because he got it for a garage sale for $2. <laughs> turns out my friends are also quite stingy. I would have preferred, <laughs> turns out it was actually one of the best presents I had. This book on Pentecost was written by an author by the name of Donald G. Has anyone ever heard of Donald G.? Donald G was the great original Pentecostal theologian who worked alongside Wigglesworth in Britain. You all know who Smith Wigglesworth is? Yep, Brother Smith. And uh, he, he was the one that would take a lot of what Wigglesworth was preaching and, and, and create theological material. So I get given this book, I open it up, it says, Dear Maud, Love from Mavis. February 1939. I was like, this is an old book. Clearly Maud was trying to get Mavis baptised in the Holy Ghost. Mavis was a Baptist, obviously. My cat's name's Mavis, but that's not relevant right now. I like a good cat. I actually can't stand the thing. I don't know how it even moved in my house. That thing, when it dies, it's going to hell. Uh, You know the problem when all you people wear masks in church? I don't know what you're thinking. I don't know what's going on under there. I don't know if it's judgment or encouragement. <laughs> Can you hold up a number? Can we do it like the Olympics? If it's about, hold up a four or a three, because right now, the, 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 yeah, anyway. So I'm flicking through this book on the Sunday morning on Pentecost Sunday. In my church, Pentecost Sunday is like Christmas. It's our favourite. It's where we just have a hoo-ha. It's like, I mean, it's the Sunday we tell people, don't bring a friend. It's not going to help them. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to leave with more questions than answers, you know. <laughs> we bring all the modesty cloths fresh from the dry cleaner. We're, we're ready to go. We have church, you know. So I'm flicking through my, my little my little Pentecost book and there's a chapter on being filled with the Spirit. And I read this chapter and, and, and Donald G says this, he says, being filled with the Spirit is a recognisable condition. He says, you cannot be filled with the Spirit and not know that you've been filled with the Spirit. And he said, and you cannot be filled with the Spirit and other people not know that you've been filled with the Spirit. When you get filled with the Holy Ghost, you know You've been filled with the Holy Ghost. When you get filled with the Holy Ghost, other people know. You, if I walk, God, what's the freeway here? That, what's that, the big one? The East Link. If I walked out on the East Link and waited for a Mack truck and I step in front of that Mack truck and that Mack truck hits me, when I get up, if I get up, when, when I get up, <laughs> let me just tell you, I'm gonna walk differently. I'm 
I'm gonna, it's true. They brought me in for theology, by the way. That's why I'm here, just to give you the deep revelations of the Lord. Do you get hit by a Mack truck? You walk different. You talk different. If I got hit by a Mack truck and then went home to my wife Donna, she's saying, honey, there's something different about you. I'll say, yes, dear. I was on the East Link. I stepped in front of a Mack truck. I'm never gonna be the same again. If you get hit by a Mack truck, you know you've been hit by a Mack truck. When you get touched by the Holy Ghost, you know you've been, come on somebody, do you believe that tonight? When you get filled with the Spirit, you know, if I went to the wall over there and found a, an electric socket and I pulled the plug off and licked my fingers a little bit and touched the wire, how many know you would feel something? <laughs> oh, Jesus, help us. You know, people think being touched by God's delicate and lovely, you know, not in the Old Testament. It was violent. Jacob, he's crying out to God, I will not let you go till you bless me. He wrestles with God. He gets a touch from God. God breaks his hip. <laughs> what, what about Isaiah? He's like, he, he's saying, I, 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 oh God, I, 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 he's crying out to God. And an angel of the Lord comes with a coal from the altar of heaven. The angel, angels, they're not known for their compassion. They generally open a conversation with fear not, which is just code for, I'm not killing you. Uh, the, angel, <laughs> the angel comes down. He's not even holding the coal. He has tongs. I didn't even know you could get tongs in heaven. He went to barbecues galore, got some barbecue tongs. He's now flying down. No, no, no tenderness, no warning, no grace sticks it in Isaiah's mouth, burning his mouth forever, giving him a speech impediment the rest of his life. People are like, how are you, Isaiah? It's Isaiah. <laughs> I mean, I thank God for New Testament encounters with God. The Old Testament ones, they're, they're a bit wild. Mind you, the Apostle Paul's, his was unusual. He's on his way to Damascus to do bad things to good people. A light shines from heaven, boom, he's on the ground. He hits the floor under the power, gets up, Blind. I'm sure if we did an altar call for blindness tonight, we wouldn't have a huge response. You know, tonight, if you come, we're gonna lay hands on you. You won't be able to see a thing. Oh yes, please, please. Can you imagine them, the three, could you imagine the three of them in heaven having a chat? Jacob, he goes for a walk, he goes to find them. <laughs> He's like, Isaiah, tell us about the time that God touched it. It was absolutely fabulous. It was life changing. What, what about you, Paul? How was it? It was fantastic. We're over here. It was absolutely fantastic. Can I tell you, when God touches you, you know. When is the last time God the Holy Ghost got a hold of you and touched you from your head to your toe? I believe in the power of God. I believe the power of God's real and right now. And if you've got faith in this place, God by His Spirit, He wants to touch you and He wants to fill you with His anointing, with His power, with His grace. One touch of the power of God, you'll never be the same again. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> Some of you are still trying to understand, are we, are we clapping for this guy? I don't know. <laughs> you know, when you're filled with the Spirit, there are indicators that you've been filled. And if being filled with the Spirit's a recognisable condition, well, what are some of the things that identify a Spirit-filled believer? Because the Bible says in Acts chapter 6, the church was growing. And so they said, we need, to, we need to administrate this thing. So let's look for some men of good report who are full of the Holy Ghost. Well, if being filled with the Holy Ghost isn't recognisable, then how would they have been able to figure out who it was that's full of the Holy Ghost? I've got a few thoughts for you. I might get through one of them tonight because I've got faith in my heart that God wants to do something. But one of the indicators that you've been filled with the Spirit is you're baptised in the Holy Ghost. The baptism in the Spirit. The greatest gift that God ever gave humanity was the blood of His Son, Jesus. 
And the greatest gift that God ever gave Christians and believers in the church is the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And when you're filled with the Spirit, it's an indicator. When you receive the baptism in the Spirit and you have a prayer language and the gifts of the Spirit alive in your life, it's an indicator that you've been filled with the Holy Spirit. I wanna, have a, I wanna have a look at this for a minute. Jesus talked about, the last thing Jesus ever preached, He went to the top of the mountain. He says, lo, I'll be with you always. And He disappeared. But He wasn't lying. He knew that He wasn't gonna leave them comfortless, but He was gonna send the Holy Spirit and He'd be with them and He'd guide them into all truth. And, and so the Holy, the Holy Spirit comes on the day of Pentecost. The Bible tells us they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues. But in, in Luke 24 and in Acts 1, He says, go and wait in Jerusalem because you're gonna be baptised in the Holy Spirit. And we, we talk about the baptism in the Spirit and this word baptism it comes from a Greek word and we interchange two words to talk about the baptism in the Spirit. There's bapto and there's baptizo. And we, we really typically just run those two together. But I came across a poem written, and so you've got to stay with me for a minute because some of you are going to go, what, on, where are you going with this? I don't know, uh, but it'll be an adventure. Let's go together and see what happens. The baptism in the Spirit comes from two words, bapto and baptizo. I came across a poem written by a poet in ancient Greek in 200 AD. So he would write this poem fairly consistent with the use of these words in in the day. And he wrote a poem. Now, it's not an exciting poem. It's not as exciting as the Van Gogh painting that we just enjoyed, but I'm trying to be artistic as well, so I'm going to tell my poem. (laughs) Here's the poem. It's a poem about the process of making pickles. I know, riveting. Riveting stuff. I, I couldn't think of a less exciting theme for a poem in my life, but there's one. And, and he uses the words bapto and baptizo in this poem, and it gives an interesting picture. But before I start, there's something you must know. Did you know that, did I say the process of making pickles? I did, didn't I? I said that. Yeah. Do you know pickles are not a thing? Like you can't go to Bunnings and say, I need pickle seeds because I'd like to grow some pickles because with the way the world's going and prices, I need a tribulation farm and I need, I, I, I'm going to start my family on a healthy diet of pickles. We're going to grow some pickles. Pickles do not exist. You will not find once in the full account of Genesis where God said, let there be pickles. You know, there's not a mention of pickles in Scripture. They are unbiblical. But let me, let me tell you what pickles are. Pickles were cucumbers. How many knew this? Okay, me too. Uh, I knew it the whole time too. Pickles were cucumbers that have been baptised in water. <laughs> Say baptised in water, filled with the Holy Ghost. Now they're, now they're pickles. Now, let me show you how this works. He uses this, this word. He says, you take the pickle, no, the cucumber, and you dip it in burning hot water. We would call that blanching. He uses the word bapto. It goes in the water, fully immersed in the water. It softens the skin, he pulls it, you, you pull it out, and it's ready to then be baptizo, which is to put into, be put into a jar with a whole lot of other pickle, uh, cucumbers, and, and it's a jar of vinegar. And what happens is those cucumbers sit in the jar of vinegar, and the vinegar breaks through that skin that's been softened by bapto. Now it's in baptizo, and what's happening is the vinegar goes into the cucumber, changing it from the inside out out and, and, and then it becomes a cucumber, becomes pickled. And, and, and here's, the, here's the thing, once a cucumber's become a pickle, it can never go back to being a cucumber. <laughs> now, I don't know if you're clapping because I got it out. I'm, I'm confusing, you're like, good on you, dude. Uh, now, you know, 
it is scientifically impossible to reverse a pickle back to a cucumber. Once you've been pickled, you can never go back. I've been around too many cucumbers in church all my life. You walk in, you can smell them a mile away. God bless you, brother. You need to be pickled. There's believers, they're, they're so religious. The church is full of cucumbers. Well, I pray tonight, you haven't just walked into church, you've walked into a jar. And then, and, 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 and I'm telling night one, we, we dipped a little bit, but tonight, and when he says bapto, one means dip, baptizo means to be saturated. I want to be saturated in the power of the Holy Spirit. Oh, come on, clap your hands if you believe it. So, here we go. Hi. I preached this message before at conferences the following year. I went and people, a whole lot of people came in with t-shirts and say, pickle me, Jesus. <laughs> hey, once you've been filled, once you've been baptised in the Holy Ghost, you can never go back to religion and tradition. You can never go back to man-made Christianity. You can't dip in a man-made river. You gotta, you gotta be where the oil's flowing. Why? Because one touch. You know, I'm not one to advocate drunkenness, which is what I'm told is the strongly held opinion of most of the pastors on this staff. <laughs> but when somebody was drunk, Back in the day, my dad would always make a comment, that guy's totally pickled. <laughs> and you read the Scripture, it says, do not be drunk with wine. Do not be pickled with wine, but be filled with the Holy Ghost. Why does, why does Paul write about not being drunk, but being filled? And then on the day of Pentecost, the first thing people said is, these people, these people are drunk. It's nine o'clock in the morning. Dan's hasn't opened yet. <laughs> hey, don't laugh at that. All these masks, the masks and the glasses just started fogging up right across the room. <laughs> so I thought to myself, why is Paul writing about being drunk? Do not be drunk with wine. So I thought, well, I've grown up assembly of God. So even if you knew how to spell alcohol, you were going straight to hell. Uh, <laughs> So I didn't really know what drunk people did. So I asked Pastor Sam Grimshaw and he gave me a, he gave me a comprehensive list and it's, I've got it here. These are things that drunk people do. Number one, they become unusually affectionate. Have you ever been to like a family reunion and you've got that drunk uncle or auntie that come up, oh, I've always loved you. I don't think we've ever met. Yeah, but I know him. <laughs> hey, when, when a church gets drunk in the spirit, we start loving people, you know? Another thing that drunk people do, they dance aggressively with no regard for anyone else's personal space. <laughs> you know that person that loves Jesus just a little too much? They come into church, they, they, they make moves and you just pray that when you bring your unsaved friend, you're not sitting next to them. <laughs> and then the Sunday you bring that unsaved friend, guess who sits next to your sister dancing a lot? You know, why she moved like that? Because she's been drinking. <laughs> Another thing that, <laughs> sorry. Another thing that drunk people do is they convince themselves that karaoke is a good idea. <laughs> when you're full of the Holy Ghost, you sing to God with victory in your song. You can't help but praise God. <laughs> Another thing that drunk people do is they, <laughs> sorry. I haven't, I haven't looked at this material for quite some time and I'm, <laughs> Another thing that drunk people do is they, they have a nice lie down in public places. <laughs> I've seen that happen when people are drunk in the Holy Ghost. They have a nice lie down in public places. I grew up in church where everybody fell under the power all the time, falling over. That was just so normal to me. And I've had people come up to me how many people know what I'm talking about when I talk about falling under the power of God? I've had, I've had people come up to me and go, Fall, that falling down, it's strange. Oh, I don't know about that, it's weird. You know what I tell them? It's nowhere near as weird as trying to figure out the right time to get back up. 
That's, that's the weird part. The falling down part, oh, I can fall down, but then it's kind of like, am I the only one? And you're on the floor and you're starting to panic because you've kind of come to, you know, you're, you're kind of done. And you're thinking, is anyone else down here? Is it just me? Am I the only one lying here? I mean, I've seen all kinds of fallers in my time. I've seen people, they fall. It's like they are lost in the third heaven while simultaneously able to adjust their shirt on the way down. It really is quite something. It's great to see the natural and the supernatural working together. (laughs) Falling under the power. You know, it's actually biblical. David said, he makes me lie down. (laughs) Doesn't seem voluntary. It's not a courtesy fall. He's made to lie down. All through Scripture we see it falling down. This is my doctrine on falling down. I want to spend as much time on the Holy Ghost grill as I can. So when I get to heaven, he says, well done, not medium rare. That is... I want my well done. I want to... You know, I'm having a bit of fun, but I, I believe every believer needs to have an encounter with God where you experience His power and His anointing. Last night at the camp, just a couple of weeks ago, we saw people getting touched right across Right across the house, when you're filled with the Spirit, it's recognisable. There's manifestations of the power of God. God does supernatural things and moves in, in people's lives. I was preaching in Dallas, Texas. It would have been a conference. I reckon the room would have been very similar in size to this room. And I used to go on Twitter, but then I got off it because it's, it's a cesspool of depravity. But I was on Twitter and I was getting ready for the service in Dallas and and. The, I get a notification, someone has tweeted me. I was very excited. And, and, and it said, I'm going to the revival meeting and, and they did my at, which I can tell you, because I'm not trying to get followers, I don't have Twitter anymore, but it said, at David Hall, 1981. I'm gonna hear at David Hall, 1981, preach. And this is what she writes. So she's a, a teenager at a youth conference. She says, I'm gonna be slain in the spirit. Anyone, I see, they, they were the good old days when we used terms like that. Maybe not, freaks people out. How was church? Many were slain. (laughs) Great. (laughs) And so, and her name was Deirdre. So I'm preaching. We do this this meeting. And I finished preaching. I walk down the stairs and there's like a youth pastor and his wife sitting there. I call them out. I pray for them. The power of God touched them. And I was like, Almost inadvertently, I just, by the Spirit of God, I just pointed. I said, there's a girl in a brown dress in the balcony, just come. So like even further away than you guys are. And this girl comes down, I said, bring her up on the platform. She comes up on the platform and I said to her, I said, what's your name? And she goes, Deirdre. I was like, that's a common name, really? I said, are you the Deirdre from Twitter? And she's like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, no, that's not, they don't all sound like that in Texas, just some of them. So I said, I'm sorry, Pastor Andrew, I've been a bit cheeky tonight. Father, help me. There's a tenth gift of the Spirit that not everyone knows about because Pastor Kevin Connor forgot to mention it in his, in his writings, but it's the spirit of mischief. And uh, I have that. So I said to her, I said, did you write that on Twitter? She says, yeah. I said, well, so be it according to your faith. I said, lift your hands to God. As she did, the power of God came on her. And she came, she placed a demand on the power of God. But when you come hungry, when you come expect it, maybe if Brother Keyboard who played Hallelujah, I don't know what other songs are in that jukebox, but I'm, I think we should stick in 20 cents and see what happens tonight. <laughs> when you come hungry, there's an anointing. You know what these meetings are, are best for? Just taking time to drink from heaven. Just to let God refresh you to let God minister to you, to let His anointing just come and touch your heart and touch your life. I've got so many things more that I wanted to say tonight, but I I wanna give more time to moving in the anointing. But I just wonder if just where we're seated tonight, could we just lift our hands to the Lord? Just let His anointing just come. Let the power of heaven just fill this place. Father, let your your power fill the house. (laughs) Let let your anointing fill the house. If you're hungry, tonight's your night. If If you're hungry, God's gonna do supernatural things by His Spirit and by His hand. In the Name of Jesus, right across the room, just lift your hands to Him. Let His anointing just come. Let the rain of heaven just fall in this place. In the Name of Jesus. In the Name of Jesus. Spirit of God, 
Would you come? Fill this place. We need your presence. We need your anointing. Have your way, Holy Spirit. Jesus, maybe if the worship team want to come, that's awesome. Jesus, say, fill the house. We love you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. If you can, worship in the Spirit with me for a minute. If you can't, have a go. You never know, it'll bubble out your belly. There you go. Jesus. Just fill the room with praise. Just fill. Touch him. Don't be ashamed of your, of your prayer and worship language. Just minister to God in your heavenly language right across the house. Oh, we worship you, Lord. What, what song are you playing? Beautiful name it is. Come on, why don't we stand right across the house? Let's not move around too much. God's going to move in here. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is. The name. Come on, let's worship him. Death could not hold you. Death could not hold you. Right across the 